Thank you, Brother Denver. He preached then, back in the 50s, at least as good as he preaches now, I think. And that's great. Our topic today is God's signet, Zerubbabel, based on Haggai chapter 2, verses 20 through 23. I thank all of you who have had a part in this lectureship in preparing it and planning it, and all of you also who have a part in the School of Preaching and developing <coughs> and working with young men who want to be preachers. And I thank you for my part in that, and I thank you for this great lectureship. God's signet, which in a word is God's authority. But who was Zerubbabel, and what was his position? The story of Zerubbabel is related in several places in the Old Testament, and he's mentioned in the New Testament in the genealogy of Christ. He is mentioned also in the apocryphal book of First Esdras, which in the third chapter says that Zerubbabel had been one of three personal bodyguards of King Darius I, and that he was elevated to the rank of the king's cousin by winning a contest, a contest uh, which involved describing the greatest or strongest thing. The other two bodyguards had said one of them that wine was the strongest and another that the king was strongest. And this book says, Estrus says that, uh, uh, that Zerubbabel came up with the idea that women were stronger than either wine or the king, but that in fact truth was more important than any of them. And so the people agreed with that. And so Darius the first made him a special kinsman and gave him the golden vessels taken from the temple by Nebuchadnezzar and sent him to Jerusalem to rebuild the temple along with Sheshbazzar and Jeshua. Now Ezra tells a different story than that. And we are much inclined to believe Ezra, uh, to believe Ezra because Estrus one of the apocryphal books of the Old Testament contradicts itself, contradicts secular history, and contradicts the scriptures. The apocryphal books are really not reliable, although they do deal with history and sometimes are accurate in that history. Ezra says that it was Cyrus, not Darius, who sent uh, Zerubbabel back or Sheshbazzar back and issued the original decree to have the Jews return and to rebuild the temple. Ezra chapter 5 says that the Transjordan uh, governor, Tatanai, wrote a letter uh, back to the king, to Darius at this point, and says in that letter that Cyrus had made Sheshbazar the governor at Jerusalem. However, both Sheshbazar and Zerubbabel are called governors by the scriptures, uh, and both are said to have laid the foundations of the temple. In Ezra chapters 3 and 5, and Haggai chapters 1 and 2, and Zechariah chapter 4. So, was Zerubbabel also Sheshbazar? Uh, the opinions are divided about that. That they are two different men is stated in this apocryphal book of First Esdras, it is also stated by a number of scholars, uh, some of them conservative. Yamachi and Youngblood in the NIV Study Bible say that. Wilson in the International Standard Bible Encyclopedia believes that they are two different men. Uh, so does Charles Pfeiffer in Exile and Return, uh, one of his historical books, which I believe have all been combined into one <coughs> more recent times. Selby in Hastings Dictionary of the Bible says that they are two. R.K. Harrison, in his introduction to the Old Testament, says that there were two men. Nobody is quite certain about it. Uh, they, uh, some of them insist that 
Shesh Bezer was actually the uncle uh, of uh, Nehemiah, of, uh, of Zerubbabel. I'm sorry, not Nehemiah, of Zerubbabel. Those, though, who insist that they are two different men are forced to say that the first foundation of the temple was laid in 536 and that it had deteriorated so much that in 520 B.C. it had to be relayed. Um, this is a little bit difficult for me to quite imagine because I have read in Josephus and other places about the great size of the stones and I have even seen the quarry from which many of the stones, at least that Herod the Great uh, had carved out, stones that were solid limestone, four feet by four feet by eight feet, those are big stones. Zerubbabel uh, uh, may have found a way to get bigger stones. Josephus talks about some stones that were 20 feet long. At any rate, there are others who say that they are the same man. That's the position of Jewish tradition that is the position of Josephus, uh, and the explanation of the seemingly conflicting data is simpler, really, if Zerubbabel is assumed to be Sheshbazar. Uh, Lockyer probably echoes the feeling of most writers when he says that Sheshbazar was probably the name given to Zerubbabel by the Babylonians because uh, he was an important person being in the royal line of David and it was not uncommon for one's name to be changed when he was given a position of authority. This happened to Daniel and his three friends in Babylon. Uh, it also happened to King Jehoiakim, who was formerly Eliakim, and Mataniah, who became Zedekiah. Zerubbabel was, in fact, of the royal bloodline of David and may have been renamed Sheshbazar by the Babylonians. And the Persians may have continued with that name and not change it. Haley thinks the fact that Ezra 3 uh, verses 8 to 10 and chapter 5 verse 16 and also Zechariah 4 9 referring to both names as having laid the foundation of the temple implies that they were one man, that the two names simply are one man. McClintock and Strong say that. They think that Zerubbabel had probably served like Daniel in the king's service king of service of the king of Babylon uh, and was kept on when Cyrus conquered Babylonia. Kyle agrees with this. Horn in his five volume introduction to the scriptures says Sheshbazar and Zerubbabel are two names for the same man. But what was his office? Uh, there's some argument about that. There are some, uh, those who think that there were two men, who insist that Zerubbabel was a tax collector. But as a matter of fact, uh, he is called a governor by the scriptures. He was, he was uh, by Haggai several times referred to as the governor. Even if we suppose them, uh, Sheshbazar and Zerubbabel to be two different men, it still is obvious that he was the governor or at least one of the governors. The question of how he fits into the genealogy of Christ is a little bit more complicated, and I won't go into all of the implications of that except to say uh, that he was in the genealogies of Christ in Matthew 1 and Luke 3, uh, referred to as the son of Shealtiel in the lineage of Christ. And the complications are best unraveled, I believe, by either assuming uh, that he was a product of adoption or else of a leveret marriage. One of those two, uh, I think, will suffice to show that that is not a contradiction. Now, as the kingdom of Judah in the Old Testament wound down into the Babylonian captivity, the last king recognized by God as being of the Davidic line on the throne in Jerusalem was Coniah or Jeconiah. Jeremiah prophesied against him in clear, unmistakable language in chapter 24, verse 30. He said, write this man down as childless, a man who shall not prosper in his days, for none of his descendants shall prosper sitting on the throne of David and ruling anymore in Judah. Jeconiah, with others from Judah, was taken into captivity in Babylon where he died. And the meaning of Jeremiah 
is not that he would never have any descendants, but that those descendants would not reign on the throne of David in Jerusalem. After they were brought into Babylon, Jeconiah begot Sheltiel, and Sheltiel begot Zerubbabel. That's what Matthew says in Matthew 1.12. So whatever the explanation for the problems of the genealogy of Christ may be in Matthew and Luke, and you all, I think, are familiar with the fact that there are some things there that we don't understand. I think we may be sure that they would have been attacked and disproved by the Jews in the first century if they had not been understood as accurate. The Jews, Paul said, were given to endless genealogies, and they, they knew about genealogies, and they had their ideas about that. They may have sometimes in their genealogies skipped one or more generations, but even then, they knew what the bloodlines were. There was no question about it when Jesus talked about the son of David or asked them who the Christ was, and they said the son of David. Uh, they, they knew what the genealogy lines were supposed to be. Besides being mentioned in the genealogies of Jesus in Matthew 1 and Luke 3, Zerubbabel is referred to 21 times in the Old Testament books of First Chronicles, Ezra, Nehemiah, Haggai, and Zechariah. Uh, that's according to my computer's count. I didn't check it, but I assume that the computer is right. Uh, I don't know. In the, uh, in the second year of King Darius, in the sixth month, on the first day of the month, the word of the Lord came by Haggai the prophet to Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and to Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest. In that day, says the Lord of hosts, I will take you, Zerubbabel, my servant, the son of Shealtiel, says the Lord, and will make you like a signet ring, for I have chosen you, says the Lord of hosts. Haggai 1, 1 and 2, 23 in the New King James Version. The first two of the four messages of Haggai are addressed to both Zerubbabel and Joshua, or Jeshua, the high priest. He's called both uh, in different places. And uh, though that's the case and the last one is just addressed to Zerubbabel, it's obvious from reading them that they are all intended for the people, for the people, the remnant who came back and were rebuilding the temple because they had been uh, not as diligent as they should have been in that. And they had allowed the, the um, enmities and oppositions of the Samaritans to stop them in their rebuilding of the temple after they had rebuilt the altar and had laid the foundation. The rebuilding of the temple had been started in 536 by the edict, as I mentioned, of Cyrus. Uh, and Cyrus may have very well been uh, doing that because he was told that Isaiah the prophet many years before uh, had said that he would do it and even called him by name. But at any rate, uh, the, the Samaritans came down and offered to help, and their re offer was rejected because they uh, were not pure in their religion. They worshipped Jehovah or Yahweh or the Lord, but they also served their own gods. They uh, were syncretists, we would call them today, like a lot of people uh, <coughs> who would pretty much as would a Hindu or a Buddhist. If you were successful in convincing him that Jesus was the Christ, he would simply add Christ uh, to Rama, Krishna, and all the other gods that he had and continue worshiping them. That's what the Samaritans had been doing. Both Haggai and Zechariah, now Zechariah appeared to preach four sermons uh, at, I believe Tim said, the end of August, uh, is around the end of August or the 1st of September in what would be to us the year 520 B.C. Uh, and Haggai came and preached four sermons that year between September and, uh, or August and December. And Zechariah was on the scene prophesying before he was finished, not when he first started. But both prophets, with different approaches, were urging the people to finish the job of the temple, and they were successful. I envy them a little bit as a preacher because I often preach 
and see absolutely no result whatsoever. But these men got results. They got results. And the temple was rebuilt. Uh, Haggai began his preaching in 520, and as did Zechariah, and by 516, four years later, the temple was finished. There are some ideas about Zechariah or about um, Zerubbabel that are not really valid at all. Uh, J.S. Wright notes that it's often assumed on the basis of Haggai 2.20 to 23, which is our text for this morning, uh, and also of Zechariah 6, that Haggai and Zechariah persuaded the Jews to crown Zerubbabel, uh, Zerubbabel as the king, uh, as a messianic king and that this was an act of rebellion that was quickly put down by Persia. Wright says there is not one shred of evidence for any of this. And I agree. I don't see any evidence of, for that in the scriptures. Zerubbabel's honor by the Jews lay more in his work in rebuilding the temple than in his governing. The temple is often referred to as Zerubbabel's temple. But the governorship of Zerubbabel is not much known. Now Haggai's four sermons may be referred to uh, and are referred to uh, by various people and preach sermons on them. Two, at least two of the other speakers in this lectureship uh, are going to talk about or have already talked about these four sermons uh, that Haggai preached. The first one of them is uh, about the time. In uh, the end of August, he preached about the time, and he says the time is now. Actually, what happened was uh, that there were some people who were saying it's not the time, and maybe they were saying it's not the time because for them it was the time of the harvest, and they may have said to Haggai, hey, look, <coughs> our crops have been failing, and we have got to get what little harvest we have in. Uh, so we, can't, we don't have time to do this now. This is not the right time. How many times have you heard that excuse given for something? Let me, let me just reminisce just a little bit about it. Uh, I don't even know how many years ago it was now, but quite a few years ago, there was a movement in Parkersburg to establish a school, a Christian school, which um, we already had a charter for and we called it the Bell Park Christian School and so forth. Uh, we had a meeting of preachers in the area uh, to promote this and one of the prominent preachers, I don't know, perhaps the most prominent one that was there anyway, stood up and he said, this is not the time And that was discouraging enough to the rest of them that it never was done. It doesn't exist today. It never did exist because they said that wasn't the time. Well, a lot of things happen like that. Uh, I've heard people who I was trying to urge to obey the gospel say basically that very thing. I will do it when, when I get my business well established, when I'm not working this shift work, and I can't even come to church now because of shift work, et cetera, et cetera. All kinds of excuses, putting it off. Well, Haggai said basically any time that you can do your own work in your own fields and build your own paneled houses, you can also work on the Lord's temple. And so they got to work. If you can promote your own interests, you can also do personal work. If you can go out and go to Walmart, you can also come to services. Why not? I think Gene will remember a fellow that we went to see uh, who, who did do that. He went to Walmart and so forth, but he did come to services. Well, anyway, he preached that and he got results. And then later on, in the seventh month, the 21st day, uh, he preached another sermon. Because it seems like as the temple was being constructed and the foundation were laid, there were some old guys 
who had been around, they were old enough that they'd been around when the first temple was standing, the Temple of Solomon. And maybe these old guys came out and looked at this temple and they said, Oh, this is not like the old one. This is not as good. You know, whatever. Anyway, anyway, the good old days, see? Good old days. I remember the good old days when gospel meetings resulted in many people being baptized. Have you ever heard that? So we ought not to have a gospel meeting anymore because <clears throat> don't get any results now. Or when I was a member at Biggsville or wherever, this is what they did and this is what we should do. All kinds of excuses like that. The good old days. <laughs> they say in the good old days, <clears throat> you know, all things were better. Houses, cars, everything. Is that true? In some of those good old days, I lived in a house that had no electricity, no inside plumbing, no central heating. Hmm. And we had a car. And in this car, on the, way, on the way to Pittsburgh, which was only 35 miles from our house, I had three flat tires. <laughs> Follow his father-in-law, Clifton Inman, one time said about this. He said, yeah, they don't make cars like they used to. Thank the Lord. <laughs> and that's true. Well, some of them were saying, this is just not as good as the old one. And Haggai said, God will bless you if you'll do what you can do with what you have. And you'll see the latter glory of this house will be a lot greater. A lot greater. So basically he said, you ain't seen nothing yet. You know. Just, just stick around and see. Well, then later he preached another sermon. And it seems like uh, over in the second chapter here, it seems like there was a problem that you find very often today of people criticizing the leaders. Anytime anything goes wrong, whose fault is it? In the church. I mean, anything, you know, it's the preacher. Or it's the elders. Or maybe it's both the preacher and the elders. But anyhow, it's the leaders. They're the, the, they're the ones. And there's a lot of complaining. Now there was some complaining here in Haggai. And this complaining uh, was uh, that they weren't making progress enough. Uh, for two months, it only carried away rubble. They're getting nothing done. And when that happens, some people always know who to blame. They know how to do everything. They can coach better than the coach. You know, they can call the plays better than the quarterback. They can preach better than the preacher. One woman told me that, by the way, one time. <laughs> I don't think she was talking about my preaching because I don't know if she would heard my preaching, but she was talking about the preachers in her town. She could preach better than any of them. Sidewalk superintendents, stands umpires, you know. We live in a time of blame. Think about that. Well, it's not just brand new either, because ever since Adam blamed Eve and Eve blamed the snake, people have been blaming somebody else. A baby died a couple of years ago, and the baby died of pneumonia, which antibiotics could not deal with at all. In spite of the antibiotics, the baby was hospitalized and everything was done that they could do, but the baby died. So the parents sued the hospital and sued 57 doctors. Every doctor through whose hands any of the documents came, any of the papers came, any of the, the stuff that they had written on came, all of them were sued. And the, game, the thing is still, <coughs> the, the suit is still pending. Uh, they, haven't, they haven't decided it yet, but somebody is always to blame. Now Haggai said, let's ask the priest about a couple of things here. If a priest takes in his fold of his garment some, some good meat that, that's holy, that has been sanctified by prayer and so forth, <coughs> uh, does the meat become holy because it's in the priest's garment? What about this? Uh, if... Uh, 
what if, uh, what if with the edge of his garment he touches bread or stew or wine or oil or any food? Will it become holy? Because the meat is holy, will it become holy? I said, no. He said, all right. Now, if one is unclean because of a dead body, he touches a dead body. If he touches any of these things, any food, will it become unclean? Oh, yeah, it will. It will become unclean. What's he talking about anyway? I think he's talking about the people and the leaders. The people are blaming the leaders, and what Haggai is saying is, hey, it's not the leader's fault. It's your fault. He said, so is this people, and so is this nation before me, says the Lord. And so is every work of their hands. What they offer there is unclean. Uh, whose fault is it? When things go wrong, who do you blame? It would be a whole lot better if the blame game would be stopped and we would all put our shoulders to the wheel. And basically that's what Haggai is telling them that they need to do. And then he comes to the fourth sermon, the same day <coughs> uh, as this sermon. And basically, I guess, maybe I would title it, um, The Faithful Few Will Be Blessed. It's basically addressed to Zerubbabel though it has to do with all of the people and all of the work that they're, that they're all doing. And what he says is, to the hard-working governor, he says, God is with you. God will bless you. Speak to Zerubbabel, the governor of Judah, saying, I will shake the heaven and, the, and earth. I'll overthrow the throne of kingdoms. I'll destroy the strength of the Gentile kingdoms. I'll overthrow the chariots and those who ride in them, the horses and their riders shall come down. Uh, this is the topic that Brother Edwards is going to deal with, uh, the shaking of the heaven and earth, everyone by the sword of his brother. In that day, says the Lord of hosts, I will take you, Zerubbabel, my servant, the son of Shealtiel, says the Lord, and will make you like a signet ring, for I have chosen you. See, in the true spirit of the prophets, Haggai speaks God's word fearlessly, and he gets results. God blessed the remnant and the leaders, and he gave them political as well as moral support because when the governor across the river wrote to Darius, Darius had a search ordered. He had come, of course, by that time into the kingship instead of Cyrus uh, and or or in some connection with Cyrus at any rate, he ordered in no uncertain terms Judah's enemies to stay away from the building of the temple or the rebuilding. You get involved in that and you, it'll be bad news for you. Bad news. And so the, the temple was completed. It's this message that's the topic that we want to look at uh, this morning among others connected with it. The shaking of heaven and earth and instruction of the Gentile kingdoms are spoken of in two passages. Robinson supposes that involves some of the confusion existing during the conquest of Cyrus, Cambyses, and Darius I. Jack Lewis says, regardless of whether it does that or not, be the hidden import of this oracle what it may, he says, we notice that the messianic line is traced through Zerubbabel in Matthew 1, 12 and Luke 3, 27. I will agree with Lewis on this. I will only say that there are three possibilities that have been suggested that make uh, some sense. If that day that he's talking about here, if that day is the day of the Lord, as in several other Old Testament prophets, uh, it could refer to the shaking of the Persians or of other kingdoms of that time as the earlier reference in chapter 2 seems to imply, uh, or it could perhaps, if the shaking is spiritual, be connected with the establishment of the kingdom of Christ. On the day of Pentecost, Peter quoted from Joel chapter 2 about the day of the Lord, and he said, this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. And so the day of Pentecost and the events following it shook up the Jewish system, the Mosaic system, and, and its temple didn't destroy the temple, but it eliminated the worship of the temple 
as the worship of the people of God, eliminated the Jews as the people of God, which was not understood for a while, not until we come to Acts 15, uh, that it was, or Acts 10, that it was fully understood, and Acts 15 when it was stated. Now, it could even refer, I guess, to the time when the shaking implies the removal of everything, as Hebrews 12, verses 18 through 29 suggests. The Hebrew writer talks about the shaking of Mount Sinai when the law was given, and then he says there will be another shaking, and this time the things that are shaken will be eliminated, will be removed. But there will be one thing that will not be removed, and that thing will be the kingdom of Christ, which Daniel said would stand forever. The kingdom of Christ cannot be shaken, Hebrews 12, 28. It began on Pentecost. In Acts 15, what happened there was that James quoted Amos chapter 9, verses 11 and 12, to the effect that the rebuilt kingdom of David, the rebuilt house of David, would be done so that the Gentiles could be brought in. And he said, because of this, we ought not to require the Gentiles to be circumcised, to keep the law of Moses. That was not in God's plan. Now, the fact of the matter is that the church which Jesus built is the rebuilt tabernacle of David. We understand that. Zerubbabel was a signet. That means that he had God's authority. What was a signet? Webster talks about a signet. He says that a signet is a seal, especially one used as a signature in marking documents as official. Uh, a marker impression made by a signet, like a signet ring, <coughs> a ring finger containing a signet, is often in the form of an initial or a monogram. Wolf says that a signet ring is a kind of a seal used as a signature worn on one's finger. And one says that when it was a ring, it was worn on the little finger of the right hand. Haley says the signet or seal was a ring or cylinder engraved by the owner's name in some design, worn on the finger or maybe on a cord around the neck, and it was used to make an impression. Uh, you have seen an impression made on paper by a notary public who has a stamp, or uh, in schools by a registrar who has a stamp that he stamps that thing with. In the olden times, they would do that. He says if papyrus was used, the impression would be made on wax affixed to the material. Or it would be made, if it wasn't, it was, uh, a wax, if it was clay, sometimes it would be made on clay and then the clay would be baked. McClintock and Strong say that signets were, signets were often made of stone or terracotta uh, in a frame and that that was rolled over the document uh, which was made of clay and later baked. And in rings, they're the ones who say it was worn on the little finger of the right hand. Signets is used throughout the Old Testament times to authenticate documents. Do you remember in the book of Esther, Xerxes gave Mordecai and Esther his ring, his signet. You write yourselves a decree, he said, concerning the Jews as you please in the king's name and seal it with the king's signet ring for whatever is written in the king's name and sealed with the king's signet ring, no one can revoke. Centuries before that, Tamar had used the signet of Judah to prove that he was the father of the child that she was to bear and that she was not, in fact, a prostitute as he accused her. In Genesis 41, Pharaoh took his ring and he said to Joseph, See, I have set you over all the land of Egypt. He took off his signet ring off of his hand and put it on Joseph's hand and he clothed him in garments of fine linen and put a gold chain around his neck. And from that point on, Joseph was the second in command in Egypt. 
he had the authority of the king. So the honor given Zerubbabel as the Lord's chosen servant is like a signet to Israel. And it involved more than just the authority to rebuild the temple. He already had that, and it would be completed successfully. This gave him encouragement to that end, but it also underscored to Israel their messianic hopes. It meant, that, <coughs> it meant that the political turmoil of the Persian Empire would not be permitted to interrupt the building of the temple or to keep it from being done. It also, because authority, because Zerubbabel had the authority of God to get it done, <coughs> it, it also gave him uh, the power, uh, the authority of God to stand for other things as well. Now, it, it's not that Haggai, now J.E. McFadden says that Zerubbabel was seen by Haggai as the messianic king. I don't think that's the case. I see no evidence of that. But Haggai may have, by inspiration, seen that Zerubbabel was in the line of David and would ultimately be in the line of the one who would come to be the Messiah. I don't really know about that. But we can see that because we have the help of Matthew and Luke who gave us the genealogy of Jesus. And we can see that Zerubbabel was a direct link in the genealogical chain from David to Christ. Zerubbabel had God's authority not to reign as king, but to lead the remnant who had returned in completing the temple and to assure the continuation of the religion of Israel and keep it the nation God had chosen through whom to send his son, Jesus Christ. Homer Haley says the promise made to David in 2 Samuel 7, 11 to 14 is now revived in Zerubbabel, a descendant of David through Kaniah, the one through whom the seed would come. The people are now back in their homeland and Jehovah has assured them of temporal blessings, of the overthrow of the heathen, of the fulfillment of the spiritual promise promised through Zerubbabel. The honor bestowed upon Zerubbabel was not realized in him as a person, but in his office and lineage. Matthew confirms the fulfillment of this promise as he points out the, that Jesus is the heir to the throne of David through Coniah and Zerubbabel. He was not a king. Nevertheless, that David says in Westminster Bible Dictionary, Zerubbabel was in his day the representative of the Davidic monarchy. Jameson, Fawcett, and Brown conclude that the signet of an Eastern monarch was the sign of delegated authority. And so they see the real promise here being made to Christ because Jesus said, all authority has been given unto me in heaven and on earth. At any rate, Zerubbabel is certainly a type of Christ who is the Father's signet. We know this to be true because of Jesus' words himself. Zerubbabel was chosen by God, but he's not the only one. Do you recall the passage in Revelation 17, 14, where he says that Jesus is Lord of lords and King of kings, and those who are with him, Jesus will overcome, you see, and so will those who are with him because they are the called and the chosen and the faithful. We can have the authority of God to teach his gospel. And as we teach it, we're promised by Jesus that he will be with us even unto the end of the world. Thank you.